Well, I am so pleased to welcome Shepard Preetkar, Joe Carlin Butler, <laughs> to the ashram to give us a presentation about fully sustainable housing eco texture, which is the architectural work that she's going to tell you all about. It began in the 1970s, um, whose time is now, it's the clearing age of time is now. Fascinating. And um, she's going to enlighten us, enlighten us about this topic that will become a household world word and way of living, I'm sure. Um, if anyone feels moved to support this work, we do a little donation basket. Thank you. We'll set down everybody. And, um, oh, <laughs> set down. And I, first of all, I've just been so blessed to be here all summer and to participate in all the activities and be in Sant Katar's class and be with Harry Kieran in so many activities. And what we discovered in Mind and Meditation the other day, actually yes, day before yesterday, was it yesterday? I can't even remember now, was we each took a quality that we were and our, um, an aspect and Harry Kieran picked the leadership aspect and I picked the producer aspect. It just was we were nine people and there were nine aspects to select of how our mind works and who we are. And um, it was every person who selected, it was incredible. They were like the person. It was exactly who they were meant to be. And, um, and Harsangat was um, the, the defender, the defender, so much the defender. And, one of the aspects of the producer is an architect. That was the sort of central middle aspect. And what I was thinking about just now when Harry Kieran was talking was that all good leaders need a really good architect. And Harry Kieran is a really good leader. So you need a really good architect. So hopefully I can help you with all of that. Um, I was going to start today with uh, tuning in and then I wanted to do just a tiny little bit of yoga for first chakra because this is really related to our first chakra. Um, and that is our survival instinct and how we live on the earth. So we'll just do one or two little tiny things, but let's start with our traditional Ong Namo Gurdev Namo that everybody knows. So we'll take a couple of deep breaths. We'll take three deep breaths right now. On the third one, let's tune in. Inhale deeply. And exhale. Inhale deeply. And exhale. And let's tune in. Inhale deeply. Ong. for just a moment. I want you to just take a minute to think about what you could dream about here at Guru Ramdas Ashram. Gardens, future buildings, who might be living in those buildings, how you would participate in the community, how your community might change with exquisitely beautiful, self-sustainable buildings that aren't destroying the earth by the way they operate. 
how you can grow your families in those buildings, how you could practice yoga in those buildings. and who we might attract here as a result of those buildings. mountain pose. And you guys all know, I mean, you guys are the masters. I don't know what I'm doing teaching you all, but just stand with your feet parallel and spreading your toes and draw your kneecaps up and let your tailbone come down and really feel yourself planted on the earth very strongly. And draw your sternum bone up and drop your shoulders down and feel your bones aligned so that your head is over your shoulders and your shoulders over your rib cage, your rib cage over your hips. And make that connection between heaven and earth right at your heart center. And feel yourself grounded in the earth. And you can complete the mountain pose by raising your arms up overhead, stretching up very tall. Stretch, stretch, stretch. And then exhale, you can lower your arms. And the one other pose I'm just going to ask you to do, because it's relevant to my whole story, I don't know if you all can do it, is tree pose. So however it is that you can do it, I just want you to get a sense of being a tree, just for a minute. Whatever part of tree pose that you can do. And just imagine yourself like a tree, very grounded, branches free. And then you can do the other side. Like I said, this is just a sort of, not really yoga class. This is just getting you in the spirit of connecting you to the earth. And trees pay, play a very important part in this story. Then we'll come back to start the presentation. Thank you. So um, when I got here in June, I was really inspired by Amandeep's talk on um, the Golden Temple. And I was compelled, but I'm compelled to tell everybody about architecture. And um, so I made an appointment to see him. and. I sat down in the room with him where he was staying over in apartment seven, is it, I think? And I told him all about architecture. And when I finished speaking, he said, my whole life, I have dreamed of building an ashram in India. This morning, a man called me and gave me the money. This afternoon, you sit here with me and give me the architectural plans. I came in, I, this was my first week here, um, my mom was ill, I had no idea what day it was, and I came in to take a course here, one of the classes, I was taking the classes here, and I um, went to sign in on the sheet in here, and I saw the date, and it said June 9th, and I thought, I don't think it's June 9th, but I've been in the hospital for a week, I don't know what day it is. So I think I, think I must be in the wrong room. So I went in the other room, in the next room, and um, I looked on the sheet to sign in, and it said June 9th. And then it hit me over the head that 
That was my wedding anniversary. And the work that I'm showing you today is the work of my deceased husband, for the most part, and um, work we did together. Um, and so it was very profound. And um, I had to run back in and tell Amandeep what it, that this was, what this was. And, and so I just wanted to share that little sort of thing about all of this because Amandeep said that there are vortexes all over the world. And I suspect that this is one of those vortex places. Yogi Bhajan spent time here. And so it probably has that kind of vortex energy. Native Americans also spent time here. Oh, yes. OK. All right, very good. So I've just been on a 10-day um, silent retreat, which I do once a year. And one of the main tenets, I think, of some of the Eastern philosophy is that attachment is suffering. And I think that we may, and we all desire freedom. And perhaps our emotional, spiritual liberation could somehow be connected to our physical world, world, and when we consider the integrated whole. I was thinking about why in this day and age we don't have so many enlightened masters walking around. My meditation teacher, who spent his entire life meditating, Goenkaji, since the age of 27, died la two years ago, last year, two years ago, and he never claimed being enlightened. And people, the masters that I know don't claim being enlightened. And I thought maybe it's because my husband used to say there are no enlightened people on the earth because all the yogis, they don't know where their shit goes. And that's not enlightened because their shit is destroying our planet right now. And that's a different level of enlightenment. So I understand that. But we are talking about our nest, where we live, how we live on the earth. And if we're talking about an integrated whole, We've got to address that. And I think that's what we're here to do. If Kundalini Yoga is the yoga of awareness, we are aware people. We have to be aware about how we live on the planet. So before Ecotecture started, there was Ecosia Homes. And I'll pass around this book for all of you so that you can just peruse it while I talk. This is Lee's first book. And this book describes the gravity geothermal envelope heating and cooling buildings with no fossil fuel consumption, no moving parts, no noise, simply elegant design based on the natural world. And this was the beginning of not being attached to the utility grid. The elegant design came to him from a tree. He one day looked at a tree. It's a big, long story. I won't tell you the whole story because we don't have enough time for me to get into it, but I'll tell you the rudimentary parts of it so you get the idea. And he had built a passive solar home, which is on the cover of that book, in um, 10,000 square feet in Meaden, Tennessee, and in the middle of nowhere. And an ice storm woke him up, and icicles were hanging outdoors. And in his passive solar home on the second floor, he walked out into the greenhouse, which is on the cover of that book, and he was hit by a whoosh of hot air. And he realized in that moment that if he could discover what the forces were governing that whoosh of hot air, that he would have discovered something profound for humanity. It took him two years, and two years after the fact, he was laying under a tree, and he looked up at the tree, sands under his head, and he said, why is it so easy for you and so difficult for mankind? You just stand there. You don't need to go anywhere, kill anyone, nothing. You just stand there all day long and everything, all your resources come to you. Human beings can do the same thing. Yogi Bhajan taught us that. He said that we were a self-contained system. And so we could live that way as well. I really believe that. And that's what I hope I can share with you today, how we can live like that. So the gravity geothermal envelope was very well researched. It was on the cover of Popular Science, Better Homes and Gardens, House Beautiful, houses all over the world which to this day have little or no utility bills for heating or cooling, just based on a, um, a very simple principle that hot air rises and cold air falls. And as the house in the Scientific American diagram shows you, hot air is pushed by natural gravity geothermal convection 
from the basement of the house, which maintains um, below frost level ground temperature. And that air, which in Millis, Massachusetts might be 55 or 60 degrees, even if it's 30 below zero outside, is going to, by natural gravity geothermal convection, because it's enveloped, be pushed and circulate the house. And Lee used to say the house thinks that it's underground. That means that even though it's way below zero or 30 degrees outside, the house is going to still maintain a constant temperature of what the ground temperature is. And in addition to that, you could couple that as he did in most of his architecture, as you'll notice. Depending on the site, and there's a map in that book, there's a climatological zone map, where the house is located, um, couple it with a south-facing greenhouse, and there are other tricks that you can do, and you've got yourself a nice warm house. And it depends on how you want to do that. You have to be responsive. When you're living in an Ecclesia home, you as an inhabitant must be a responsive inhabitant. It's like living in a living organism. And the people that live in these houses claim that. They also claim that they don't have allergies. The plants that are in the greenhouse filter the air. They claim that they don't get colds and they claim that there's no noise because there's no moving parts. So it's, they're wonderful. It's, these are some samples of the gravity geothermal envelope. On the bottom left is a condominium in um, Oakland, California with eight apartments that all share the envelope in the middle. So these um, houses were well studied by Brookhaven National Laboratories, the United States Department of Energy and they discovered them to be the most energy efficient houses and Harvard professors and other people wrote um, books about the envelope. And now it's a well-known technology and those of you who might know about it might know that there are people all over the world today who have picked up on it finally at last after 40 years and are um, utilizing the envelope technology to build buildings. And Lee's former partner actually started the company up again about two years ago. So I throw these platitudes out, you know, attachment equals suffering, beauty equals truth, but I believe them. <laughs> so I'm going to, it's my presentation, I'll, I'll use them. I think all of Lee's homes are absolutely exquisite and beautiful. And, um, and I do think that that has to do with the use of natural, all natural materials, and also being in tune with nature in your building practices. So. We're going to jump forward to today um, because what happened with the envelope is that technology back in 1981 got scrapped under the carpet after Ronald Reagan took office. And his first act as a president was to take the solar panels that were on the White House that my husband's friend had put on the White House and ask that man to come and remove them from the White House. A lot of people don't know that there were actually solar panels on the White House and under the Carter administration. And um, so what we were led to believe from the 1980s till about today was that alternative energy was, quote, too expensive. And Lee used to say, what's too expensive? Amortize the cost of what it might cost, the 5% more it might cost to build a, a gravity geothermal envelope home. He said, the, the cost expenses in building, are you in the building trade? No, is, in, is, is highly, is, is very much in the finishes, not so much in the actual stud work and all of that, so much of it is in the finishes. And so, and he used to say, what is the cost of sending your child to war so that we can toast our toast in the morning? Have you amortized that cost into how we build our buildings today? So these new buildings that I'm about to show you now are completely disconnected from the utility grid. Lee spent the remainder of his life figuring out how we could live 100% self-sustainably on the earth. There are many people that are doing work in this field today in many different realms of this work. There are people that are doing waste recycling systems. There are people doing solar systems. There are people doing the, all different aspects of it because we do food production via permaculture inside the house as well. But no one has come up with an integrated system. And when you're with the master, you have to keep the integrity of the master's work intact. And that's my mission. 
So Lee was the master. He was the father of environmental architecture. He did start this whole movement with a whole group of other people. But he, 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 the integrity of his designs are impeccable. And that's why I have the uh, criteria up on the wall over there. But I just want to give you an idea about the um, decentralization of the actual houses. It doesn't need to be a single house. It can be a whole community of houses. The whole community can be completely decentralized. But if you look at the comparison of the infrastructures, the new architecture eco model, which I've got a couple of pictures up over here, and I'll show you some more over here, too, is a building that has all of its utilities integrated into the building itself. So there are no more umbilical cords from the building to your utility company, to your water district, to all the other districts that you've got to get all of this information, all of this utilities from. The utility company is integrated into the building itself. Completely integrated design. That resides in the hull of the boat, in the foundation of the buildings. The buildings now all float. So they have a hull. If you notice in all the drawings that I've got up on the wall, they all have a rounded bottom. Now, where do they float? They float on the water, because Lee predicted climate change 30, 40 years ago. They float on the land in a water jacket, if you know what that is, like a gimbal. You know a gimbal on a, where, you would, where you would carve out a piece of the land and then you would fill it with water or something like that or just carve it out and then you, fill your you put your building in separately, the same shape as the hull of the boat, so that it, it can do this if there's an earthquake or if there's a flood so it doesn't get destroyed. Because in building these buildings, the tenet of these buildings is that they take nothing from the earth, air, or water they put nothing into the earth, air, or water, in their operation, that is. They take care of all of their own utilities, lights, gas, water, waste management, and food production. And they also float and also make sure that the inhabitants are secure and safe, no matter what the external conditions, earthquake, flood, fire, tsunami, hurricane. Because Lee used to say, how can you talk about sustainability if you're not talking about sustaining the lives of the human beings living in the buildings? And human beings have never built with that eventuality in mind. Thousands, millions of people every year lose their lives to hurricane, flood, fire. I've lost two houses to hurricanes. Tsunami, tornado. Nuclear, he thought of everything. These buildings take care of everything. So these are some of the patent drawings for the buildings. And that's one of the um, buildings, the, one of the designs that I have up on the wall over there. So that's a, a building that would be floating out where I live down in Florida on the water. It's got a glass bottom swimming pool over there on the left hand side because I like to swim in, in, the, in the ocean, in the water. And so he designed that one for me. And um, the whole utility is right here in the foundation. This is the utility infrastructure. It's right here. What's under there? Those are all tanks for waste, for water, for storage of solar electric, and even food production tanks under there. Your building all takes care of its own food production as well. And this can be done in permaculture. One of my friends in Florida just wrote a book called um, just one backyard. He has a backyard about the size of this building. And um, he was a former statistician at the South Florida Water Management District. And he did all the calculations on what it costs to truck your food, to get your food to the grocery store, the gasoline used to bring your food to the grocery store, the gasoline you have to use to use your car to get to the grocery store. I mean, an entire study he's done. You can look it up online. It's called Just One Backyard. And um, discovered in, in his one backyard, he can feed his family in just one backyard. So we can all do that kind of thing. And I know you're starting on permaculture projects, which are amazing and great. Permaculture is the way to go. And architecture utilizes permaculture. So these are some of the, the, um, 
the drawings, patent drawings for these kinds of things. So um, that's a, a drawing that he did for how you would cool a building, an existing building, like buildings that you have now that are potentially on air conditioning. In Florida, we have a lot of buildings in air conditioning. And then there's, um, there are other modes. You could do it for heating. So these are how you could retrofit various systems. This is a bio, gen bio uh, generator for methane and organic fertilizer. So you can take the poop from your toilets, the stuff from your, um, your garbage, and you can actually cook it. And you can make useful fuel out of it. And you can also make useful uh, fertilizer. With fertilizer in um, gardens, you have to add do a few additives. But for the most part, you can use it. And so, but if you're in a totally self-sustainable system, you're going to want to do that. So these are things about um, how you can um, how how you can retrofit even the existing buildings that you have here. So um, first principle of yoga is ahimsa; it's do no harm. And don't we want to live on the earth without doing harm to the earth? I think so. I think it's something we maybe want to do. One of my platitudes again, I guess. So this shows how um, these buildings operate. And I've got this drawing right here. So you can look at that in greater detail. So it shows you how the, that, how the envelope system is a part of it, how the various organic waste tanks and floating foundation works and salt water um, electrical storage and um, the, what the buildings are made of, the solar panels, et cetera, et cetera. So you can sort of view all that. And when I used to do these lectures 25 years ago, 23 years ago, I started 23 years ago, people used to think this was like way pie in the sky, crazy, crazy, crazy stuff. It's not. And all of what I'm showing you right now we can make tomorrow, and I, I know how to make it tomorrow. None of these have been created yet, but it can be made tomorrow. And they can be made as individual homes for a very nominal fee once the factory is up and running. So we can talk about that in a minute, too. So um, Lee designed, this is my favorite of all of his designs because it's a design for a temple or an ashram or um, whatever your religious organization might be. The size of a human being, you can see, you can't really see very well, and there's about like that there, because those are like the doors over there. So he said we could design architecture to be for, the first presentation that I did was to the United States De Defense Department to retool the shipbuilding facility in 1992 in Charleston, South Carolina, so that the Defense Department could make pods, individual floating, um, uh, housing for troops, for four troops. They would be no bigger than 500 square feet, 400 square feet, a very small little unit that would house four troops. They could be tethered behind a big ocean-going vessel, all of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them, and float right from where they're built in Charleston, South Carolina, right to the Indian Ocean. And then when troops are on mission, they don't have to interfere with the local people and that kind of thing. But um, anyway, the fellow at the Defense Department told me at the time, he said, Jill, do you know how long it takes to move an oil tanker when you start the turn? No, I have no idea. And 27 miles. He said, that's how long it takes the Defense Department to make a move. <laughs> he said, that's how we move over here. <laughs> but in any event, so I think this is what Amandeep and I are kind of talking about for um, sacred spaces up in the Himalayas. And it may be something, you've got some property here that you might start considering for um, a sacred space here as well. I don't know. I don't know what your plans are. But what I'm hoping that maybe I can do with you all is over time, if there's interest, is start a process of participatory design in which we create a master plan and that all the members of your sangha, of our sangha, um, get together and put, have their input as to what's important to all of you. Each one of you has your input. Even I brought paper tonight for you all to start writing down or drawing out or imagining what you might imagine for your dream, for what you dream for this place. It's not 
not within our reach. It's really within our reach. We can make it happen. And one of the reasons why I'm particularly interested in talking to all of you, aside from the fact that I love you all, is that, and I love this place so much, is that we're all meditators. The power of our meditation is so incredible. It's so amazing. And we can put this into our prayers. And we can have an effect on the entire globe by all of us deciding that this is something that's important. I'm not going to say this is what we should do. I'm going to say that if you want to, it's something we can do. And I would be more than delighted to help facilitate that whole process, to help facilitate making this happen. And I believe that we could, a small group of us right here, just a few people in a small little ashram in the middle of Millis, Massachusetts, could actually change the world. And um, it's, it's, it's not as difficult as we think. What's happening right now in the world is that um, this, when Lee designed these things, his teacher was Buckminster Fuller. And Fuller had come up with a whole series of factory produced houses that he had specified back in the 1950s. And this was Lee's great inspiration, great teacher. One of the things Fuller said in his book, Critical Path, is that there would come a time in the future, which is now, that all the hardware would be present, that we could provide the content. And that's what I've got for you right now, is I've got the content. The hardware is all present. And we can make this happen if you desire to. Um, the, the original buildings, like I was saying, that I had presented with Lee to the Defense Department in 92, and the same buildings that I'm going to propose for here, um, in the, would be mold made, not mold made, extruded in a factory. And that extrusion process was not even in the minds of human beings back in 1992 in ancient history. And, but it exists today, and it's called 3D printing. And there are people making 3D printed houses right now. There's a man in China who's making 3D printed houses in China. He's popping them out in production for $5,000 each. They look like a little ticky-tacky square thing like this. And they come out, and they're housing people in China. He's, he's, he's popping out 10 a week or something. I don't know how many, but uh, quite a few each week. These houses can be 3D printed. The difference is what these houses will have is they will be completely integrated. The design calls for them to be completely integrated. They used to call that doped. And what that means is that the walls, within the walls, will have all the windows in them, We'll have all of the plumbing fixtures in the plumbing um, systems in them. We'll have all of the electrical systems in them. The electrical system, by the way, is another thing I'll talk about. And they come out of the factory just like this round little thing, round little house. And they pop out of the factory. They pop out of your 3D printer, and they can just go right on site and be utilized and be inhabited by a family the next day. So this technology is here. It's not, I'm not talking pie in the sky stuff. I've heard for 23 years that I was talking pie in the sky stuff, but I'm not talking pie in the sky stuff. The technology exists today, and we can tap into it. And so that's just a, another idea. So I see a, a, something like this for you guys in the future. I see um, a beautiful plant-filled holistic environment where you have your edible landscape and your beautiful, our, our beautiful whatever going on right there. And um, I want you to imagine, it, if you can, that something is possible. My husband already drew out your yoga studio for all of us right here. <laughs> he drew that out years ago. <laughs> so it's already, been, it's already been imagined for all of us. <laughs> and I don't see why we can't do it. You, you, I was at the full gong, um, gong the other night, and there were hundreds of people in here. It was like so exciting. I, w I went to the new moon, and there, there were, you know, 10 people or something. Then I came to the full moon, and it's like 100 people. And so I was going, wow, the place is already too small for how many people are coming here, and it's going to keep getting smaller and smaller for the amount of people that you keep attracting. 
So um, I just, you know, if you want to, I like I cut up some paper and we can play with these ideas. You can ask me questions. I, I might have forgotten to say a few things or, you know, it's it, whatever you want to ask me or whatever ideas you might have and however you think that we could make this happen or however it interests you to make it happen because maybe it doesn't interest you at all. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> I don't know how that goes. Yeah. So I understand with the envelope, the heating and cooling systems, mm -hmm. how does the electrical work? The electrical is solar. They're solar panels. Now, the solar panels now, um, I know people in Colorado that are making solar cells that, um, mm -hmm. pardon me? Glass. Yeah, they're making glass that's solar. They're actually, there are people that are making solar um, cells that can go in the roadway so that they light up as you drive on the road and show you where there's a car accident or how to drive on the road. And they light up at night. And they're, I mean, there's just amazing. This is the off the shelf technology that is so readily available today that when I started giving these talks was not even in the consciousness. And so it's, it's completely available and it's really off the shelf. The other thing is, Lee used to say, he used to go, Jill, there's two things that kill people. What's that? He used to say judgment and the buildings that we live in. And he said the buildings we live in all work on ACDC current. ACDC current, he said, is wreaking havoc with our brain. So none of these buildings use ACDC current. They use low voltage, 12 voltage lighting, LED lighting, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then, what, so I'm just curious about particularly, so the water source, and I've seen LED buildings that have um, a full composting toilet system, like the Audubon Society. Right. Building the well fleet has all these, you know, tubes underground. Right. It gradually works its way through. Mm -hmm. It takes a long time. Right. Um, and it gives the right capacity and everything like that. And I understand the permitting varies from area to area. It does. Well, um, that depends. I mean, yes and no. I mean, you can, there's ways of also creating your own water. So it depends on how far you want to go with the technology. And yes, you, you probably will have to utilize a water source at the beginning. I think this can be a gradual process as well. The, and I think the investigation that is required for each individual need is great because we could put a whole committee just on investigating what type of toilets we want to put in these systems. And that committee could come to us and say, these are, the, these are what we have investigated, and there's so many out there today. You should see what China and, and Brazil are doing with toilets. It's like fabulous, you know? And so, so we, you know, a committee could, no, it really is. And, and, and what's really sad is my sister lives on a permaculture farm in Northern California, and she used to have this, uh, she has this awesome yurt there and one of her farm workers is work is living in the yurt it used to have this amazing self composting toilet there she had to get rid of it because the county came by and told her that it was not doable and this is happening all over america just what you were discussing the permitting and the um planning and zoning that has to go into all of this so again this is why i bring it back to our meditation because as we meditate, these are the kind of things that we can imagine as well. When Lee used to just have to do the, grab, the book, The Gravity Geothermal Envelope, and have to go in front of a planning and zoning boards to tell people in 1975, whatever it was, that they were not going to have an HVAC system in their home, they were like, uh, I don't want to hear about that. And he used to say, if you get the planning and zoning board and you get one person on the planning and zoning board to cave, usually the whole planning and zoning board caves. So one of the things that we're doing in Colorado and one of the projects that I'm working on is we're becoming really good friends with the whole entire town. It is a town of 101 people, but <laughs> it's a lot easier than Millis. But you can, you can, um, you can have plants. You know, you can make, make friends with these people. And there's, nowadays, there's a lot more sentiment towards environmentalism, there, especially here in New England. I'm trying to put, I live in a townhouse in Florida. I'm trying to put solar panels on my townhouse. I have an HOA that is like this. 
they're not letting me put the solar panels up. I'm like, what century were you people born in? You know, it's hilarious. I mean, and, and there are cases like this all over, especially around where I live as well. So yes, you, there are a lot of obstacles that we have to overcome in order to go the full hog on this. But I believe that as we continue to dream about it and continue to know what it is and focus upon what it is that we really want, and as the group makes a cohesive idea of what it is that we really want, that anything is possible. And it's really just up to all of us. I don't think it's anything else. I think that we learn this in, in all of our work. This is what we come to yoga about. It's not just doing the exercises, is it? Is it something more than that? Yeah, Dharma. Uh, well, what is more than that is that we share with the town the and perhaps with the zoning board, have them come to yoga classes. Exactly. And, and bring their, elevate their spirit. Exactly. So, and then we can also, I don't know what it takes to become part of the zoning board. Absolutely. But I think that would make sense. And we have people here, Sadhguru has been on the conservation committee. And, Good. Um, we, we do have an activity. So Great, and I, and I like that thinking. I really like that thinking. The thinking is why not elevate our local town officials and, 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 and include them in this whole process that way. And I think, yeah, and I think that's happening. I think that what Hari Kiran has done here is amazing and it's inclusive and it's really, it's about community. And it's not just an isolated community. This can be a showplace. This can be a showplace for the entire world. Well, our collective prayers have brought people like Kali Singh, Exactly. And all of us. And people come. Yep. And this land is very, very special. There is actually a lot of water under this land. Mm -hmm. So we have thought of building digging well here, there has been a well here. So, you know, there's a, obviously a marsh running through it. So, you know, there are possibilities. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, I, I really think that that's the, the thing that I felt and that I really feel is the meditative potential of a spiritual community to not just elevate what it is that we're doing here, but also, like you say, help in the elevation of all of the people around us as well. You are, we are the example. And so we could be that in the way that we live here on the earth as well. And, um, and let it be a completely integrated whole. Isn't that what yoga means? It is the integration of the body and the mind and the spirit. And the body is the physical. And so this is the part that we have somewhat neglected in a certain way. I mean, we've, we've done a lot of work on our higher chakras. And um, I was actually going to, to start this whole presentation. It's almost time to finish up, but I was actually going to start this presentation with a book. I, I wrote seven books in 1996. You, I say anybody can read my books in one minute each, so I'll only indulge it. This is, um, and they each correspond to the chakras. And this is the first book I wrote. It's called The Little Purple Book. It actually co corresponds to the Ajna Chakra because I have, I have this whole hierarchy. And the first book is Ecotecture, which my husband did with me. And the Ecotecture book corresponds, like I said at the beginning of the class, with our first chakra because that's our elemental, where we live, how we survive on this earth. Okay, so The Little Purple Book. I ask you to take a deep breath. And you can just close your eyes so you can have a visual. All human beings have certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. In order to enjoy these rights, all human beings have the right to clean air, zero pollution, period, pure water, zero pollution, period. 
clear, clean bodies of water, all lakes, ponds, pools, and seashores must be accessible, crystal clear, and free from pollution. Spacious vistas. Seeing natural, uninterrupted vistas uplifts the soul and must be afforded to all. Healthy foods. No person on this earth should go without food, ever. Shelter and privacy. Every person is entitled to a safe, clean, healthy living environment. Health and wellness. Taking responsibility for one's own health and happiness will bring contact with the one true self. Wealth and freedom. To accept the responsibility to manifest the wealth and freedom desired. Hold any belief in a sacred place in which to practice. Convene for a common purpose. Human beings need to work together with the common purpose of making sure that all the rights of the Little Purple Book prevail. Fortunately, there's a solution, architecture. This integrated database will provide employment worldwide to redesign and rebuild our existing systems to replicate nature, utilizing universal energies without combustion or friction to meet all human needs. So thank you very much. Satnam.